Goeiedag en welkom bij deze extra aflevering van In Gesprek Met. Ik ga vandaag in gesprek met uh, Nuggie Cox en zij is ingenieur bij NASA in Los Angeles. De organisatie die zich bezighoudt met ruimtevaart. Ik praat met Nuggie over um, haar werk als ingenieur. En zij is een van de, de personen die de robots die op planeet Mars rondlopen om daar onderzoek te doen of er daar ooit eens leven was, opereert. En um, helaas is het eerste gedeelte van dit gesprek, vanwege technische problemen, kunnen wij die niet aan u tonen. Dus u ziet vanaf het moment dat ik aan Negi vraag wat er gebeurt als een van deze robots een stuk gaat. Parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feature sep has separated. We've found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers and descending. Standing by for backshell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single dot if you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Yeah! We use our, our human brains to try to figure out what to do next. Our ability to fix the rover is limited because we don't have astronauts, yeah. right? So we can fix it. If something goes wrong, we can fix it by how it operates, right? And some of our older rovers, they had to start driving backwards because one of their front wheels was having a problem. Okay. So we can change the way we do things and we can change the software. But we can't change the hardware because yeah, it's all yeah. the way on Mars. Yeah. And it's been there for 10 years already. One of, them. one of them has been there for 10 years, and that's just, we're so proud of that. Yeah. So, so what, if, what is one of the most um, uh, spectacular things you found out about Mars, thanks to the rover? Well, the rovers that we have sent over the years have basically been trying to answer the question, could Mars once have had life? Yeah. And the first rovers found there is water on mm -hmm. Mars, which was the prerequisite, yeah. as we said, yeah. my favorite drink. Yeah. And then the next rover discovered the water was there long enough. Mm -hmm. Mars once had oceans. It is not like that now. It's dry and cold, but Mars once had oceans and rivers. And now this, and so we know that Mars in the distant past could have been habitable. Hmm. There could have been life, like microbial life. So this next rover is finding out, was, did Mars once have life? So each mission has answered the question it was sent to answer. Okay. And now we're ready for the big one. Did Mars once have life? Hmm. So this rover, because that's such a, that's such a big question, mm -hmm. it's hard for a, a robot to say, voila, Mars once had life, right? That's a, that really needs a lot of analysis. So this rover's job is really to pick up samples mm -hmm. to, for us to bring back to Earth so that then the scientists of the world mm -hmm. can take these priceless Mars rocks and decide whether or not Mars once had life. That's hard for a robot to do. We have to bring it back yeah. to the humans. Okay. Do you think um, there was once life on Mars? I think that, I mean, we have no evidence that there was life anywhere yeah. other than the Earth. Yeah. But as we learn how to do this, mm -hmm. first we wondered, was there water? anywhere yeah, in the solar yeah, system? Yeah. The answer is yes. Yeah. So I think there is a possibility that we will find in our lifetimes that, there's micro that we will find microbial life. Mm. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of water. 
right? But even microbial life would be such a discovery. And, and again, we're not talking about aliens, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about microbial life. So it's a very exciting time in, uh, in the space program and uh, uh, to, to see what comes next. Why is it important to find out uh, these things about Mars? So part of what happens when we visit other places is we actually learn about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've learned from Mars is like I said, it used to have water. Mm -hmm. It doesn't anymore. Venus, right next to us also, has a greenhouse effect. And the biggest issue that this planet is facing is climate change. Mm -hmm. And when we learn about other planets, we go, so Mars was once more like the Earth. It's not now. That is an existential lesson for all of us that planets don't stay the same. Just because a planet sustains life or sustains water doesn't mean that it will. So it reinforces how important it is that we take care of this planet. Yeah. So, so much of what we learn about the rest of the solar system is really learning about ourselves and highlighting that this is a big deal. And Suriname is a huge part of that, right? The, the, um, the forest, the Amazon, yeah. it's a critical part of our ecosystem, mm -hmm. which we're busy playing around yeah, with, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and so for me, it is quite significant to have had the opportunity, to have the opportunity to be here. Mm -hmm right and to, and to see this incredible country and the role it plays in the future of the planet right yeah. such a such a privilege but um, you just mentioned um, the importance of uh, of the research NASA is doing on Mars how do you bring that over to governments because what we see in the world is that governments they they do say um, yeah we know we have to take care of the climate change um, they say it with words, but their actions are different. So how does NASA bring over this message to make sure that they really pay attention to climate change? Yeah, I think you know that this is something that, uh, that is true of all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. Is having the data. I mean, NASA's job is to get the data. And in yeah. fact, you know, partnering with Suriname in, in, in some of these conferences and things yeah. to make sure that just like we have a big data set about what Mars is like, what data set of what the Earth is like. Then our job, again, like others, is to give it to the governments and say, here is the scientific evidence mm -hmm. of what is happening. Yeah. And I think we all have the responsibility, including governments, of, of paying attention to the data, right? And saying the evidence for climate change is there. What are we going to do about it? It's also not just saying we're going to take action, right? Another role that the engineers and scientists have is being able to make suggestions about what that when the when the when when everyone feels like this is something we want to address, mm -hmm. the next question is going to be, and how do you address that, and what do you do? So part of that, and again, I believe this is what some of the conferences that have been held in this part of the world are about, is we have the information that climate change is real, and this is what's happening, and here's what's causing it, but what do we do about it? Right, how can we, what can we do in terms of emissions, in terms of carbon sequestration? Yeah. So I know that, that we feel like part of our job is being able to answer those questions mm -hmm. when they're posed to us of, okay, now what do we do? Because we have a limited amount of time to work on yeah. this. And so having the data and having the possible solutions uh, is a big part of what research agencies do, not just NASA, but yeah. universities and again around the world saying, this is a big deal mm -hmm. and, what, and, and having, the, having suggestions to what to do about it. Very interesting. I didn't know all that. Okay. Um, I want to go back to you, Nagi. Um, how was it when um, you started working at the NASA, especially as a woman? So I have wanted to work where I am at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California since I was 14. And, and so my 14-year-old self just wanted to work there, right? Didn't really think about what it, what it might be like. And I was in the U.S. Air Force first. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And then, uh, uh, and then as much as I enjoyed that, I wanted to, to get to NASA and do the uh, exploring. So, you know, I still remember the first day I walked through the gates of JPL 
and seeing a place that was, I thought even the walls were interesting, right? All the posters and pictures of other planets and having come from the Air Force where, you know, it's duty on our country, mm -hmm. right? To come someplace like JPL and NASA where it's all about the mission. That felt very, I felt very connected to that. That um, having a job where it's, where, there, where there's a specific goal that we're trying to achieve is, is remarkable. It's not like every day is happy, 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 yeah. right? Everyone has bad yeah, days at yeah. work. Everyone has days that, you know, where you have to do something administrative. Yeah. But it has always been rewarding. It's not always what you do. It's why you do it. And so I feel very lucky. Okay. Have you ever felt uh, not welcome because you are a woman? Oh, right. You mentioned about yeah. being a woman. So I have to say, when I was in the military, and that was like 30 years ago, mm -hmm. certainly the military had far fewer women, okay. right? So, so there was definitely a, you know, look around, like when I went to graduate school, mm -hmm. I was one of only, I, I was the only woman in my class, and there were very few women in this military graduate school. Yeah. Now I walk into the lobby and I see more women in the lobby than the whole time I was there. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of progress yeah. in the U.S. military in terms of re, um, the number of women. NASA itself is probably about 30% women. Mm -hmm. And, and that number in certain areas is growing. Have I ever felt unwelcome? Not at all, right? And uh, certainly it's about, you know, we have a rocket to launch, we have a mission to launch, so it's about what can you contribute. Now, that being said, NASA is working hard as our, you know, to increase representation. And there are still certain areas that, um, you know, we try to encourage more um, uh, students to get involved in and to be interested in. And that's why I have to really thank the, the U.S. Embassy for the opportunity to be here in Suriname uh, because I think this message of yeah. careers you might not have thought of for yourself yeah. is universal, whether it's talking about it here or in the U.S. because I think all the space agencies and all the STEM fields, mm -hmm. you know, need, need the kids to be able to see, hey, that could be something I'm interested yeah. in. Well, we'll come back in a minute to your visit to Suriname, but um, asteroid 14061 is named after Nagi Cox. What was the feeling like? Uh, you know, I was astonished. <laughs> I'm still astonished yeah. that, uh, that an asteroid was named after me. It happened in a very unexpected way. Mm -hmm. uh, the discoverers came to a presentation I gave yeah. on the rovers, and I guess they were actually trying to think of a name for the asteroid. And the, the conversation that we shared and the stories that we all got to tell, um, I think were, were what they were looking for, for, uh, for a naming opportunity. And when they kind of came up to me and said, we're gonna name this asteroid after you, I remember thinking, what? <laughs> you know, I was so astonished and I didn't actually think it would happen, right? So I said, thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed the, yeah. the, the, the talk and the stories. And then like a year later, I found out it was really happening. And I was, I was just, I'm still astonished. It's, it's wonderful, right? It's wonderful. And I have gone back to the observatory mm -hmm. where the astronomers worked and, and visited with them. And so I, I'm still astonished every time I think of it. I can imagine that so good feeling to, to have something like that named after you yeah it's quite you know i have to say the first thing i thought of was okay is it you know where is it yeah. and, uh, and and how far away is it doesn't like pose a danger to the earth or anything <laughs> like that um and it's uh, yeah okay. it's, uh, and then your visit to Suriname. um what are you going to do here so I've actually been here a couple of days, again, at the invitation of the embassy. Yeah. And I'm here to share uh, stories about space exploration as an example of STEM, right? And what you can do with science, engineering, and math, and encourage women and uh, girls, and also boys, to consider these possibilities. So I'll be visiting, I have uh, visited some uh, STEM, like there are some, you know, some remarkable organizations already, right? A STEM club, a robotics team. Yeah. I'll be speaking at the Polytechnic College, yeah. um, uh, and then also at the, the university, okay. the 
uh, whose name I don't quite have yet. Anton de Combe University. <laughs> University. Yeah. Uh, and so there, so there are uh, opportunities to talk with groups like that and also to hear from them what excites them. So I'm just here for a week mm. uh, and then we'll be uh, going to uh, Redi Doti yeah. to, uh, to also uh, have conversations there. So it's great, you know, we, I spend a little time talking about what I do, but mainly it's about hearing from them and questions and answers. It's mm. been great so far. And I, I, and I understand that at Redidoti you will even launch a, something like a mini uh, space or something. Is that true? I think they are going to have like some mini rockets, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the things that is so exciting about STEM is there are some basic experiments mm -hmm. and fun activities that you can do with kids yeah. so that they get a hands-on feel for what it's like to build something and then actually try to launch it and yeah. have that sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have heard that there will be some, some hands-on yeah. at Ready Doti. Sounds like fun. Um, what does... An, Maybe there is a parent at this moment uh, watching our con con conversation and thinking, okay, but my, I think my girl is interested or my boy is interested. What should he or she do to be able to get where you are? That is such a good question. You know, I was very lucky that um, while my father was not as as jazzed about what I was kind of interested in, oh. my mother was mm -hmm. very supportive. Okay. And, uh, and what, I, you know, what I learned from that is it only takes one person to support another. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a parent or a friend or whomever, I think just encouraging their daughter or their son when they see them be curious, right? Intellectual curiosity yeah. is, is the start of everything. So whatever they may express interest in, um, to encourage them, and especially if it's an area where they might feel like, oh, but, but I'm not supposed to be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Science, math, engineering, that's for others, right? And, uh, and it just takes a moment to say, oh, that's great, yeah. right? Or you'd be really good at that, or just something, so that they don't, there's a moment where you could turn away. Right? There's a moment where an idea, a thought, a possible future might occur to you. And that moment, if, if there's encouragement to consider it, as opposed to, oh, well, girls don't do that, right? Or something that turns away. Mm -hmm. So we all have the ability with a smile, with encouragement, to, in, to keep that possibility alive. Yeah. Okay. What's your biggest dream? What is my biggest dream? I've actually, uh, for me, I've achieved it in that I'm working where I wanted to be. Yeah. And I, I'm so lucky, right? What's my biggest, my biggest dream is that I'll be able to continue doing what I'm doing, participating in missions of exploration. And I really love exploring this planet with my husband. And so I hope that, that we are able to continue um, in, this, in this very lucky life that I have. Yeah. And to also share that with friends and family. I mean, I wish for the earth, right? What's my biggest dream? That we would learn from what we've just come through with the pandemic, that how important our time with friends and family is and what we can do when we work together. And so I hope to see what we can become because sometimes it feels like we're at a bit of a crossroads, mm -hmm. right? We could go a little bit down the, the dark path, right? Yeah. Of where we don't believe science. We don't use our ability to think. We let other people tell us what to think. And, you know, off we go down the rabbit hole. But there's this other path of of trusting the evidence trusting our brains thinking about things seeing that we can work together and that's that's the world i'd like to see i i that's the dream that i'd like to see what happens in the next few years and i really hope we choose the path of light right as a planet that's nice we're going to the end of this uh, conversation unfortunately um but I have a question. I think if I don't ask it, pe people are going to, um, will not like me anymore in this country. But do you believe in aliens? 
do I believe in aliens? So for me, it's not a matter of belief, mm -hmm. it's the evidence. Mm -hmm. And right now, as we talked about earlier, there is no evidence of life elsewhere in the universe. Okay. However, if we, there is evidence, and our job is to follow the evidence, mm -hmm. but there is also the wonder of the universe we live in. If we, if, you, if we look up mm -hmm. and see stars, which again in Suriname you can see a lot more than I yeah, can see in Los Angeles, yeah, yeah. but if we look up, saying that we are the only ones is just, we don't know that, yeah. but we also don't have proof that life is only here. The universe is filled with wonder that we can see just by looking up. So even though we have not found any concrete evidence of life anywhere other than the Earth, does not mean the universe is not full of possibilities. Full of possibilities. Yeah. Because people are seeing um, these, how do you call them, those space... Uh, uh, oh, the UFO. Yes. That's actually a good, a good question for us to, to perhaps finish on, because I can... Yeah, 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 no problem. Is yeah. It, it, that one of the things that has happened is very recently, you know, there's been discussion about uh, within NASA and within the, 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 uh, the U.S. of addressing some of these UFO stories mm -hmm. that are out there. And I'm so pleased with what we're doing, right, because by by opening up the data and making it available and this is what NASA is doing it's not nothing changes about the scientific process yeah. now it's like okay here's the data and if if you see one thing mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked this thank you if you see one thing that is unexplained mm -hmm. you don't say voila aliens right you say this is a thing that I don't know the answer to and then you do the same thing you would do with any problem you address it scientifically and you say huh okay let's see if we can reproduce that can it happen again it's subject to peer review meaning that other scientists and engineers will look at the data so you don't just say that I don't know what that light was that must have been a flying saucer alien you say we don't know what that light was and everybody looks at it you look at the weather data the climate data could it have been a, what could it have been and you start using the brain power of the world to investigate it so that is absolutely the stage that we should be at every time there's something like this we should look at it and investigate it and see if we can reproduce it see if we understand why it happened and then you come to the conclusion Carl Sagan, who was one of the, his, his, his TV series, Cosmos, inspired me and uh, was one of the inspirations. And one of the things he said that I always try to remember is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We don't go, voila, that's a, that's a UFO, that's a, that's a spaceship, right? We, we look at that and then we look at the evidence, we work together to try to see how that could be explained. And that's a great place to be. And that's how we should, uh, uh, that's a good way to address all yeah. of the, uh, the questions that we have, yeah. is using our ability to, to investigate scientifically. Okay, I'll finish with the next question. Is the sky the limit? The sky is not the limit. Yes. Not for any of us, not for the kids of this country, yeah. the kids of the world. You know, we are, we are out there. We are exploring. It's not just NASA, it's the space agencies of the world, it's the private companies, right? It's, it's uh, Ariane Space and SpaceX. And the more we get involved, the more we realize the sky is not the limit working together as a planet. I am so proud of us. When I look back at the pandemic, I see all, which is we're still coming out of, I see all of the difficulties we had. But I also see mm -hmm. that as one world, we developed a vaccine in a year. In a year, yeah. that doesn't happen. But it was the first time in human history that scientists and doctors could exchange information. And look what happened. The sky is not the limit. And we, we prove it not just through space exploration, 
but how we work together to solve problems here. I'm so proud of it. I've been telling people the sky is not the limit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Nagi Cox, engineer from NASA. It was an absolute honor to talk with you today, and um, I hope I'll see you maybe in Los Angeles one day. I would love that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And enjoy Suriname. Thank you very much. I will. Dat was het gesprek dat we hadden met uh, Nagi Cox. Uh, zij is een engineer bij NASA. Ja, de NASA. En uh, zoals u het zelf heeft gehoord, the sky is not the limit. Bedankt voor dit moment um, en tot een volgend interview.